We're going to talk about energy boost today. How do we do that? How do we have energy that almost seems limitless throughout our day? That's very important for you to be productive in multiple facets of how you live. Certainly you have right now, you're at work, you have your work life that you need to be show up and productive for and have energy to do the tasks that need done. Also in family and other areas, you want to show up for the people around you. So you are not a grumpy Gus or a hangry or just negative Nancy in a sense or just negative in general. What we do want to do is to enjoy life to its fullest and maximize energy throughout the day. And how can we do that? So let's jump in and talk about our agenda today. We're going to go overview of energy in general. We're going to go sleeping for energy, eating for energy, exercise for energy, and lifestyle for energy. I'll be trying to give some anecdotal stories and dive in. So our overview of what this is. Let's jump into you and we'll start off strong with some chat. So in the Q&A box. Why do you want to have more energy? What's the point of tapping into our human resources with energy? Could it be work? Could it be family? It's a Friday right now as we speak. I want to make sure I have lots of energy tonight when I'm hanging out with my kids after I'm done with my work day, talking to people. One of the easy ways I do that initially is to just stand. Right now I'm standing during this presentation and it gives me lots of energy to stay moving and agile and fidget a lot to express myself, to stay focused to what matters most. So, well, it looks like one of you said, why do you want to have more energy? Well, it's for your family. This weekend you're going to be busy doing a lot of fall events. That's exciting. We too will be most likely going to a theme park with the Halloween Horror Nights and, and Halloween Weekend type events. And at some point we're going to be doing a pumpkin patch. And the one that we go to has a lot of activities. We want to be able to run around. My kids, I have four kids. I'm 40. I've been married 17 years at this point. I want to have energy with my kids to create lasting lifestyles and memories for them, which is really important. So excellent. Let's move on. So benefits of high energy. Daily tasks feel less burdensome. You literally can be more productive throughout the day. The load on your body, your mental energy system, your emotional energy is less. You can face what's ahead of you. If you're tired, you're just worn out. You're more likely to be grumpy or easier to anger in a sense. So we want to find simple pleasures a lot easier. Your improved mental capacity. Your brain can expand with that energy that we have and not be on low battery. It's important to have the energy in your day to get to be doing problem solving tasks. That's incredibly important. You can create solutions for the situation you're experiencing and how to manage them. Even having mental capacity for myself after school, want to make sure I'm showing up for my kids and I'm not tired or I want to take a nap or I just push them off to say screens. Don't want to do that. I want to engage with them as they come off their day and see how they went and how it can help make their day even better going into the evening. You're more present in interactions and relationships. Right now, I have a lot of good energy. Hopefully, you feel that and... This is going to help our communication here go a lot better as well. You can show up. You can listen better. You can engage better. You can get feedback better, input, or just have that active listening. Your relationships will foster even better that way. Easier to be mindful when you have the energy to be present. You can think about others more importantly, they're, what's important to them, how can you help, serve, give, be generous, kind. Those are really rewarding energy giving activities to other people. Oftentimes, you'll see that energy come back. Often, this world is just about energy exchanges. And we're trading energy back and forth. That's why I love for you to engage and share and, and post questions and such. 
that really helps boost my energy that you're paying attention and not have this open on one screen and something else open on another. I want you to be present. It gives me the energy that I need to present well. What are the costs of low energy? Inability to regulate before emotions, snapping at others, easily annoyed, frazzled, feelings of being overwhelmed. These really start to showcase themselves in a big way when you are tired, you're fatigued, unrested, you haven't had your sleep. All of that really directly impacts your ability to be on top of your emotional game and not let it run wild. Your inability to prioritize, procrastinating on things that really matter. There's a concept, MIT, most important tasks. If you focus on three most important tasks every day and accomplish those, you're going to make really big moves in your life and allow you to be able to create more of what it is that you want. You attract that positive energy as well. Procrastinating delays that. You delay doing the most important things, often just do busy work that often returns in low energy as well. Doing big, most important tasks return big energy for you. Like, wow, I accomplished this thing and I, was, I feel a lot better, a lot more excited about what's ahead. I can move forward. Today, I've been moving through some of my most important tasks. I re-recorded a video that didn't turn out so good the first time. Is the microphone issue, more importantly. Number two, I have another video to make to post to my socials. That's going to be talking about how to make sure that we stay focused on the task at hand, being consistent in what it is that we're trying to do and not focusing on complaining or around not actually doing the work and wondering why you're not having problems. Those are some of my main priorities. When I do that, it's going to be a lot better, more exciting as well for me to show up that way. Low creativity, unable to think outside the box. You can't problem solve. Someone comes to you with an issue that needs a solution, big or even little, you can't get into a creative mindset to look for other answers to the situation you're facing. That's not good. People want to show up and come to you with the fact that you have energy, you have confidence, and you're able to deliver on the goods of what that is. Let's move on to sleeping with energy. Sleep is where we refresh our body. We have their circadian rhythm. Usually seven to nine hours is where most humans are going to fall. Occasionally we have our outliers that may need more sleep and some people just need less. I end up, because of life, generally fall into the seven, six, seven-ish time range. My wife loves to go to bed late at midnight. My kids have to be up at 6.45. I'm the one who takes them to school. I get sandwiched right in the middle there, which is, it is fine. It's not a problem. I have plenty of energy going around the day. Sometimes I use caffeine. We'll talk about caffeine. I use that appropriately to help keep energy going. I don't use it as a stimulant to push through my lack of consistent sleep. That's not good. I need to do that. And I'll, in fact, take a sip here real quick. We have a... A peppermint mocha type coffee today. Very delicious. Now, recommended goes off. You can find this uh, time and again in the studies of humans just doing really well around seven to nine hours. We can still get away with six depending on what tasks are at hand. If you're just staying up for the fact of staying up, eh, I could say... Shame on you for not prioritizing sleep more in your life and doing other things that are most likely unproductive in that time. That's not going to help you have more energy the next day, even though it may feel fun and exciting to do so in that moment. All right, next up, sleeping for success. Let's set up the bed situation really nicely here. Number one, try to wake up by natural light or use a gradual alarm. Having, back in the olden days, you woke up with the, 
the sun. That's how we did it, right? And then when it was dark out, you went to bed because there's nothing to do. Now we have our screens, we have activities, things that keep us up past the dark. And oftentimes we're not physically tired and that keeps us up even longer. That's what we don't want. Don't want you to stay up late because you're staring at a screen or your body's just not fatigued enough to go to sleep. Oftentimes the mind is very tired, but the body is not. So waking up in natural light, having the windows open, there are alarm clocks out on the market where you can have gradual noise and lights start appearing into the room. A lot of smart devices are out on the market these days to be able to facilitate that, to have a more gentle wake up. I like waking up to my watch. I then have my next one is the is is my Apple Watch. Or sorry, not my Apple, my phone, my iPhone. I usually place that in another room to allow me to actually get up out of bed to go turn off the 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 alarm beforehand. So here we go. Having uh, have a comment in the chat box. Excellent. So temperature. This is it's always going to be dependent on who you are. Some people like to have the room a little bit cooler and they pile high the duvet and comforters and snuggle right up in. That's fine. If you prefer more 70 or 73, great. You just need to find what your ideal sleeping temperature is for you to snuggle up and get some rest. We certainly know if things are too hot. My wife and I have fans on our bedside to help blow on us at night if during the summer when it was really hot. And then ideally I'm able to snuggle up with her at, at night if it's cold out and, and more, stay warm that way. But ultimately just the temperature in the house needs to be appropriate to what you do and is, is for you. So thank you for the input. I appreciate it. Establishing bedtime routine. In this picture, we have books. We are avoiding lights. Ideally, you are looking at using some sort of a, a light filter. Your computers, your phones can filter out some of that. There is reduce white point on the iPhone. I use that quite a bit as the night starts coming on and it's dark out, uh, make sure that the screen isn't blasting my eyeballs. It's just too much. I'm, oh my gosh. I do not want to stare at this bright light. It's, I, I don't like it. I actually will turn down my screen brightness quite a bit. I'll put on reduce white point and make sure that screen, I use dark mode a lot as well in my, and, and it, it really helps me Make sure that I'm not getting that blue light there and I can shift into bedtime. Sleeping in a constant routine, making sure you go to bed at the same time, ideally works great. Certainly the weekend can be a little bit different for a lot of folks because it's a break in the daily routine. Most of you are going to work at a set time and then the weekends are different from that normal time. Just don't want to be waking up at six and then Waking up at noon on the weekend, that's going to cause a lot of problems in your sleep patterns, especially when you get right back into the work day on Monday, staying up late and then having to wake up early. Not a great start to a Monday. Other things we did read, I love Sudoku at night. That's a great way for me to narrowly focus my energy on numbers and patterns. It really slows down my body. Now, I've, I physically move a lot. We'll talk about activity. I do plenty more than 10K. I usually work out as well. I'm going to be working out after we're done with this with my friend. So there's going to be a lot of exercise output, burning a lot of energy. This night, I will be tired and ready to sleep. So that is part of my daily habits to make sure I get adequate rest. Things like drinking tea can really help as well. No caffeine, of course. We'll get the the Earl Grey or chamomile type on there and uh, reading something that's exciting for you as well. Things to avoid around this caffeine within six hours of bedtime. Caffeine, that's about its half-life. It will be out of your system then. 
having something in the afternoon, two or three o'clock is ideally not the best situation for caffeine, even if you are running low on energy. That'll go into the food portion of this. I spend a significant amount of time talking with people about food. What we want to make sure is that you're eating wholesome, good, balanced food meals in a timely manner. Therefore, your afternoon is a lot more productive. Oftentimes, I'll figure out ways to get my clients to move on their lunch break. They have a lunch that's manageable, easy to eat, and enjoyable, and they eat it in very few minutes, allowing them to get up and move and be active. Movement is energy. That often creates a very positive next couple hours for them. Alcohol, we want to make sure that you are occasionally doing alcohol, moderation is always best in that situation it just drags on your system your body has to process alcohol and it takes energy to do that not in a good way we all know most likely most of us have woken up with having a little too much and not feeling the best in the morning it doesn't give your next day a lot of active energy to be able to be productive Sugar, sugar gives you that energy and comes crashing down and then you're done. We don't want that. That's not fun, not exciting, not enjoyable to do that. That's oftentimes if people end up, Halloween's coming up in this particular time right now. There might be office candy and you might find yourself nibbling on that a lot more. What that does is actually slows down your energy And it doesn't help you. It'll boost you up a little bit, but it'll bring it down a lot later, causing more drowsiness and fatigue and low energy. Generally, meals are within three hours of your bedtime is a good way to wrap it up. Just helps the body to settle digestion and everything. Complex problem solving and critical reading. We don't want to do that before bed. That gets our mind wired and moving and active not helpful for you to be able to problems. You don't need to problem solve. If anything, you need to write down on a piece of paper, journal what is in your brain, get it out of the mind. Therefore, you'll allow your subconscious to take a breath, to just be easy, much easier on it. We have tension, emotions, anger, frustration, We want to avoid that as well. Obviously, don't want to go to bed upset or angry uh, at someone or something that's going to fuel this cortisone and stress in your system. It's not going to allow you to go to sleep early. Sound, loud sounds. We certainly can do white noise. There's all sorts of weather type noise or just the static TV type sound. We'll do that occasionally. That ends up being a pretty enjoyable way to fall asleep. It it omits the outside noises that come in. We have cats. They like to make noises at night. The white noise can help block that out and keep us more at rest. All right. Energy from eating. Very important, obviously. That's how we fuel our bodies. This is where I spend probably 90% of my life is talking about food. Number one, quantity. Consuming smaller, more frequent meals. You don't want a heavy, burdensome load of food or a food bolus in your stomach. Think after Thanksgiving. Not a great thing to do. You end up in a carb coma. Your body's processing all this food and calories. It naturally slows you down. All the blood pulls from your extremities and and your body functions into digesting. Hence, again, allowing you to feel sleepy and tired. The body regulates blood sugar and other metabolic processes more efficiently when not overwhelmed. In general, I find most women eating really comfortable around 300, 400, maybe 500 calories a meal. And most gentlemen are 400, 500, 600 calories in a meal. That really has seemed to be pretty efficient for keeping enough energy and eating enough food until you get to the next time. That's a very 
simple phrase that I say with a lot of my clients, eat enough food to get you to the next time you're going to eat again, makes tremendous amount of success with eating an appropriate amount and not over consuming any one type of food, macronutrient and whatnot. Takes more energy to convert excess calories from storage and then more energy to break them down when needed. Your body is constantly storing fat, releasing fat, storing carbs, releasing carbs. And this is a way to be a lot more effective at being able to do that and managing your overall energy input and output. Therefore, ideally, you don't have to worry about your body weight so much either. It takes 20 minutes of, from your time to from start eating for your brain to send out the signal of fullness, right? We know that. One powerful strategy I have with clients, drink a glass of water before you eat anything when you're eating out. Drinking a glass of water will obviously help with your hydration needs of the day, but it also starts signaling this fullness factor. You'll start to feel more full, which is a really great thing. We want to make sure that fullness is aligned and you're not eating excessive calories to get full. Again, limit caffeine and alcohol quality we don't need to eat organic everything or cage-free grass-fed or something like that those are obviously say pinnacle types of food that you could eat what more importantly we're talking about here is eating quality meals focused around balanced with the macronutrients of lean proteins healthy fats carbohydrates. I even break the carbs down into what I would call fibrous carbs. Think of vegetables and fruits or starchy carbs, your traditional rice, pasta, beans, lentils, legumes, things like that. Obviously, we want to limit foods containing simple carbohydrates, sugars, corn syrups, fruit juice concentrates. That's just concentrated doses of food in small packaging that, again, lift your blood sugar levels up which then your body releases insulin to deal with that and slams your, your blood sugars back down, leaving you fatigued and often overwhelmed. Eat a diet rich in micronutrients like vitamins, minerals, and essential amino acids. If we have lots of colors in our meals, it's going to allow you to have a lot of vitamins and minerals in your diet. You're gonna feel a lot better from that as well. If you just, oftentimes I'll tell you, I have clients take pictures of food. If you just take pictures of food of what you're eating every day, you're going to start seeing patterns of behaviors around what you eat. You're going to become very aware of it. Ultimately, in most situations, if you look, you're going to have very basic colors that will encourage you then to eat a lot more different colors. Oranges, reds, greens, yellows whites, not necessarily processed flour type whites, but even rice or onions and things like that. Cauliflower as another example. Cook foods in natural ways like steaming, baking, sauteing. That's important to find ways to create foods that taste good. My first call today with Richard Trying to figure out how do we get him to eat more vegetables. The guy only eats like two vegetables, broccoli and another one. He hasn't really had a lot of peppers or I love roasted Brussels sprouts so good. And it's important to be able to try foods in different ways. We can steam foods like broccoli, but we can also just buy frozen bags of broccoli and steamer bags. That's a really more convenient way for you to be able to get that in in the first place. Always looking for some level of convenience in this process, that's important. Uh, things like baking, roasting, or sauteing. I would generally suggest monitoring how much oil you use in that process. You don't have to book, uh, cook in oil, that's okay. You. You can roast vegetables without oil. You can saute food without oil. Uh, oftentimes, water sauteing is a really great alternative if you're trying to manage calories. All right, timing. 
Uh, if you have any questions, please just throw them in the chat box. We'd love to talk to you and answer some of those. Timing eating, you'll ask me around three hours before bed. That just allows the digestion tract to settle down and allow your bodies to function on just sleep. Avoid eating too close to exercise. If you have food in your stomach, I mentioned it before, blood's going to get pushed into your stomach to manage that. Certainly two hours or earlier or longer before you work out are good times for you to eat. But also, depending on what it is that you eat and the timing of it, you can manage that as well. For example, oftentimes my athletes, they have to eat. Some of them doing longer exercise activities need to eat food even during their exercise. I had a gentleman that did an Ironman. He was eating 400 calories every hour for five hours. We needed to find easy digestible foods. We used things like honey, granola bars, peanut butter and jelly sandwiches, all sorts of different products that he really enjoyed, the sport product type drinks and such. There was a lot of different ways that we could get food in that allowed him to enjoy getting the calories in and it keep his blood sugar levels up and functioning. It's going to be basically based on your tolerance on the proximity of the meal to get to you to eat if your sensitive is a little more sensitive we we'll want to make sure that you have more time there before your workout i could eat a meal and go run 10 miles i've trained my body that way it doesn't bother me i wouldn't eat a heavy meal but i could definitely eat 500 calories and go out the door and start running that in a sense would help me be more functional and productive and keep my energy levels up during the run. Plan small nutritious snacks throughout the day to avoid a binge fast cycle and stay fueled. We want to make sure most people are going to eat, say, breakfast, snack, lunch, snack, dinner, or breakfast, lunch, snack, dinner, or breakfast, lunch, dinner. Those are the general protocols that most people eat. Again, the more meals you have in the day, the smaller the meals need to be in terms of overall calories to help manage your body weight and energy needs. You want to be strategic in it. You want to eat around times that are logical for you to actually put food in your mouth and it work in your day. You don't want to have conflict around when you're going to eat in the first place. Also, going back to the concept of eating enough food for when you're going to eat again, Super important because if you know you're going to have four hours of meetings, the meal before you eat, that you're eating before those meals start, we want to have it be pretty robust. We want to have a lot of calories there and good balance to get you four or five hours. When you get done with your long meeting set, you won't be famished or hungry or likely to make bad decisions. Hydration. Drink before you are thirsty. I'm trying to stay up on my, with my turtle's cup here. We have that going on. Uh, so what we have, drink before you're thirsty. Consume at least half your body weight in ounces each day. That's super important. Ideally, 60 to 80 ounces as a minimum, absolute minimum for women, Men, I would always encourage more, 80 to 100 or more. If you're really active, women should definitely be over 80 and men should be over 100 ounces of water a day. Carry around a reusable water bottle. Make it as a, you have those markers on those bottles that you get, the motivational quotes and stuff. You can certainly do that. I have a 40 ounce water container I drink from. That allows me to stay on track with my water needs in a day. I don't have it with me. I have coffee as an enjoyable beverage to sip on right now when I need a little throat and water going, liquid going down my throat to keep talking. In general, how I use my 40 ounce, it's a big red container. It reminds me of like a fire extinguisher look to it. It's not that big, but it's just that's, that's what it, it gives me that idea. 
what I want to do with that is have the first 40 ounces before noon, the second before dinner, the third before bed. That allows me to equally space out my water consumption. If you're drinking 80 ounces of water in a 16 hour time frame, allowing eight hours of time to rest, that's only like four to five ounces of water every single hour. You might be thinking, hey, what about if I have to go to the bathroom a lot? I want to make sure that you spread it out. If you go five hours without water and consume a lot of water at one time, you're going to find your way to the bathroom quite a bit. Ultimately, be mindful of your activities and the environment and how it impacts your hydration. Warmer climates, hot climates, uh, think of South, the Florida and Texas and some places in California have clients that are still dealing with 100 degree temperatures. I'm up in Ohio, I'm dealing with 60s, 70s right now. Much cooler, I don't need as much as I did say six weeks ago when it was 85 or more, most likely. We didn't have the hottest summer. The hottest temperature we got to is when we went to Florida and it was in the 90s, 95. But when in Ohio, it barely got to 85 a couple times. It's more like 80 degrees, which is pretty nice out. Um, but didn't need excessive amounts of water. But if I was in, I remember a story when I was in Sedona on a family trip, we did the pink Jeep tour. We're driving around, get halfway through the tour, just having a fun on the red rocks and such. I'm thinking, oh, I'm kind of feeling thirsty here. I haven't sweat like all day because of the dry climate, but that water is getting sucked out of me. So it's important to make sure you have your hydrations appropriate. All right, here we go. Next up is exercise for energy. Here's the active guidelines that the American Heart Association recommends. 150 minutes per week of moderate aerobic intensity. Think of walking at a nice pace. Or then we have the other alternative, 75 minutes of vigorous aerobic training. Something where you're in a, an exercise class, you're training for a race or something, or you're in the gym doing strength training as well. With strength training, or I would just label it as muscle building activity, something that focuses on strength training or building strength in your body, more importantly, it can be lifting weights. It could also be doing boot camp classes or Pilates or even active yoga classes. Those can be ways to stimulate the body or going outside and digging around in the dirt and such on the weekends. That could qualify for some of that. Obviously, it's not strength training, but it's still physical activity for your body. So that's important. All right. Strength training builds muscle and strengthens bones, making everyday tasks easier and less tiring. I absolutely promise you, your 80-year-old self will thank you, your younger self, now that you involved yourself in some form of strength training. Even just exercising three times a day, a week, excuse me, three times a week, you're going to be more functional and better than most of the world population. You'll be more consistent. And that's going to help strengthen your bones and make sure you're able to handle everyday tasks. Having strength training or activity exercise, your, your sleep's going to help improve recovery. That's why getting at least ideally seven, eight, nine-ish hours is going to be incredible for you to just literally feel a lot better. Supports mental health and helps quell symptoms of anxiety, depression, and fatigue. Everyone always almost says, I feel better when I work out. Really important things to think about in this situation of managing your strength, your energy, it boosts energy, it boosts the feel-good hormones that you have. It's really important to be able to keep your mental health in check and doing activity is really important to do so. Is anyone doing some exercise on a regular basis? I was a personal trainer for 15 plus years. I've owned gyms as well. 
would love to see in the chat box what type of exercise, strength training, cardiovascular training that you're doing. So you put that in the chat box, it'd be great. Are you getting your 10K steps? That'd be the other challenge. Get 10K steps on your watch every day. That's really important. So cardiovascular training strengthens heart, resulting in less energy to pump the same amount of blood. <laughs> you'll ever hear, you'll hear this every so often. Someone say, "Oh, your heart only has so many beats for your life, and if I exercise, I'm gonna run out sooner." That's not really how that works. <laughs> But the cardiovascular training, keep your heart rate up, allowing your breath rate to go up. Working in an aerobic or anaerobic situation will allow you to strengthen your heart and it'll pump more blood flow using less energy that will fuel your body with appropriate cycling of blood and feeling a lot better and recovering yourself. Releasing endorphins that raise energy levels. Get up move, you're going to feel way better after that. I highly encourage walk breaks on a regular basis. I think that works wonders for you. It's very important to be able to do that and allow you to feel really good that way. So move frequently, maybe have a lunch walk group or even an after work group if that made sense. Increases uh, mortality of, of molidity of fluid in the body, preventing stagnation. So what that means is you're constantly circulating blood flow. If you have diabetes, as an example, diabetics have poor circulation. They have a lot of issues with their feet, their ankles, their their calves. The blood is pooling there and not circulating. That causes buildup and doesn't keep the body freshened up and getting new red blood cells into the area and oxygen circulating. So that that's really not a good thing. Next up is lifestyle for energy. All right, so posture over time. Modern lifestyle shifted our body posture to a less efficient posture. If you look, we most certainly round and round and round our bodies as we go. If you don't have good ergonomics, you're not doing well and you're less efficient in your body mechanics. Collapsed seated positions result in imbalances of postural muscles where some muscles are overworked and others are stretched. If your shoulders are rounded forward, your neck traps become elongated an elongated muscle is usually a, a stressed muscle. It's not in its natural length. It's constantly being pulled on and there's tension there. Uh, just like if we were overly tight and we needed a massage, we'd want to stay loose and find just nice optimal. It's one reason why I like standing a lot. It forces me to be in a good posture so I stay upright. I don't like sitting. It's I feel... I just ache <laughs> to be honest afterwards i move a lot i work out and i get sore as a consequence of that all right pain energy depletion to maintain collapsed position it just costs a lot to be in a poor position you don't feel good again the the movement of your blood flow lymphatic system is going to decrease especially if you don't move a lot and you're not going to clear waste sufficiently and allow your body to work. You might end up with issues of lymphatic issues, draining, drainage and such, or poor circulation. All right, diaphragmatic breathing. We're going to do this here in a second. How your body breathes will help determine the available energy. So we're going to breathe into your belly. We're going to fill up your belly with breath. That's the easiest way to think about it. That will allow you to get as much breath inside you and allow you to fill oxygen, red blood cells are going back into this situation here. Uh, next up is going to be exhaling naturally increases the heart rate while Exhaling naturally decreases the heart rate. So breathe in. 
the heart rate's starting to pump more, and exhale, the heart rate is relaxing more. Do you, and when we breathe, I'm illustrating this via video, we don't really want to breathe and have our chest or shoulders go up. We want to breathe and have our belly expand. Using di your diaphragm is the most energy efficient way to breathe. So we have more oxygen getting into the body and you're able to then produce more. If you have less oxygen and you're breathing shallow breaths all day long, you actually don't get breath in you. You're not going to have the energy you want. You're not going to have the brain functioning because there's not a lack of oxygen. Your body's just not going to work as well as it should. So let's try it. We can put our hands on our belly, hands on our chest. What we're going to do is we want to breathe in. You want to make sure that you are focusing on belly breathing. Usually we breathe in through our nose, out through our mouth. And that really just helps us feel a lot better. It, it actually calms the body too. Even if you pause a little bit in between the inhale and exhale, that helps just relax the body too. Let's go one more. Breathing in. And exhale. That works great. All right, downtime. Body and in the mind need a break to recharge. You literally have to have rest. Humans depend on it to function. You can't just go, 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 go all the time. You will burn out physically, mentally, emotionally, for sure. And people will see that and you'll know. You'll just be grumpy, hangry. You, you won't be very fun to be around. What we have, thinking takes as much energy as competing or running sometimes they have a study where they put polar heart rate monitors on the chest of chess players because of their breathing the rapid breath that that breath that oxygen consumption turning into carbon dioxide that all costs energy Someone sitting and focusing and thinking and breathing hard and, and can burn a lot of calories. Playing chess in a high-performance stake situation can actually get you to burn some a lot of calories. You would have It's more than just lazily there. It's this was a study that was shown during a, an actual competition. One thing you could do is look it up. Search ESPN. Chess players burn calories, and you'll find it pretty quick. Screen time does not equal rest time. That's really important. Your brain is still assessing the input that's coming in. Watching something, scrolling on TikTok or Facebook or whatever your social is, is it's constantly managing, categorizing, processing that information. So we'd want to step back. Reading a book or meditating or doing a yoga class or a visualization experience, that helps you check out and decompress there as we go. Mindfulness. A less busy mind is less exhausting. When we're focused on being mindful and opening up our mind, we're able to think more clearly. We have a calm about us. We can be resourceful as well. Your body's not running in overgear, constantly turning through information or processing or worrying about whatever's coming up. Practicing mindfulness techniques uh, can be recharging and give the mind a chance to observe reality rather than engineer or analyze it. A lot, a lot of people are challenged with mental health, we'll say that word, challenge with their mental health because they're constantly stuck in this analyzing analysis paralysis and getting too much input and we just need rest go back 200 years if you weren't doing something active you're just playing or being outside or soaking up sunshine or that was rest it wasn't this go 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 constantly getting inundated with information from our phones or our computers or TVs. 
allows you to process what has happened to you rather than react, analyze, or correct. So processing what's happened to you. If there is a situation or circumstance that shows up, you can take a breath, you can relax in it, you can find a solution that's going to actively engage in that for you to not react to it. All right, compassion and truthfulness. Through compassion, you take more thought in how you care for yourself and others. Takes mental energy to engineer a situation and maintain what is not authentic. Sometimes you really have to think about a simple question. Are the thoughts that I believe actually true? They might not be in all reality. If you can slow down the brain from turning over, you might actually realize you are engineering a future worrying about something that doesn't or shouldn't be, isn't going to happen. Allowing you to have that mindfulness and, and be restful, you can actually take care of yourself and others. Active listening is a very clear way that you are in uh, showing some compassion in an engagement with someone else. And you don't have to foreshadow what may or may not come of that situation. Next up, restraint. Be aware of your limits, whether physical, professional, interpersonal. Learn when to say no and how it can be an act of self-care. Declutter helps the mind feel less. I remember a client, Sarah, decluttering every, I worked with her for a long time, every two to four weeks, there would need to be this, say, purge of clutter. Things would build up, she is busy, 50 years old, working in a environment, uh, a remote corporate wellness, a corporate environment, two kids, 13 and five. This is always something her husband, things would build up. She felt stress from that. She would, it would take away from her. There would be no energy. That That's important if you feel stifled from clutter, you would definitely want to make sure that you stay away from it. Say no. Learn how you can say no is a form of self-care. You don't have to say yes to everything that comes your way. You say no to the things that don't hold your most upward priorities, and that's about setting good boundaries and limits. You don't overcommit yourself. You commit yourself in a timely manner with proper deadlines. Therefore, you don't feel overly rushed and drained of energy because you're trying to pump out something in less time than it should take naturally. Positive attitude. Negative self-talk triggers fight or flight response. Look to compl compliment rather than critique. Reframe how you speak to yourself and others. Instead of I have to try, I get to. It's just a lot about attitude. Is your glass half full or half empty? Is the sun shining or is it cloudy? If it's in the sun, you're going to obviously be, uh, if it's daylight out, the sun is shining somewhere, even if it's above the clouds. That's just a silly thing to think about. And for me, that's what I think is sun's always shining no matter what. So we want to avoid self-talk triggers. I want to be aware of what happens when you have self-talk and be aware of what you say or think. Some people are just literally unaware of it and it causes a lot of stress and strain. Compliment rather than critique. Positive, constructive feedback is always important, especially in the workplace or any other place. It's very important for me to positively compliment my kids and reinforce the good things that they're doing and offer solutions to the things that they could improve upon. Values and purpose. The more that you identify with your purpose of being, of what you do and why you're here, the better life is going to be. The more energy you're going to have. My purpose is to help people live healthier lifestyles that ultimately result in them gaining so much more life experience. So I help people lose weight, get stronger, help them better time manage, better stress manage, these things lead to them being so much more productive and creating a better life. It's 
exhilarating when we start connecting all these dots. So living in harmony with your values and purpose provides the energy to take steps towards accomplishing goals instead of feeling burdened by the steps needed to get there. That's super important. Then you can, if you have purpose, you can look at what the end goal is and work backwards from that to meet you where you're at now. It's exactly what I do with my business or with other areas of my life. Where do I want to go? How do I get there? And I start looking at the roadmap. You can find me on all the social medias because I'm there. I'm posting content. I'm trying to deliver value into the world of helping people literally do better. And that drives me to do more of it. And then when I'm working with clients who are receiving results, it's intoxicating. It's just amazing. Avoidance. We want to avoid... Uh, so avoidance and attachment patterns. Begin to take note of what you avoid in your life and how checking in on it uses your energy. Identify where you might be possessive or obsessive behaviors or are you truly, you're overly attached. The phone could be one, checking your socials all the time, checking your email all the time, having patterns of behavior around gossip or comparison those are bad patterns to have in your life. We want to try to avoid those and avoid toxic environments as much as possible. By narrowing your perspective into too small of a lens, it takes a lot of energy to maintain as well. If you're hyper-focused on one situation that's happening, if you just step back a couple steps, you start seeing the bigger picture and all of a sudden it's not as impactful as it once was. So let's chat. Do you have any avoidance or overattachment patterns in your life? Are you doing things that are obsessive, possessive, or overly attached to? That would be, uh, oftentimes I find most, some people are even overly attached to just stress itself, which then causes this ripple effect. You get a dopamine hit from the stressful situation but it's also it's a negative situation but then it circles around bad behaviors of overeating or substance abuses or something like that it's not good all right conclusion energy provides you with the fuel to accomplish your personal and professional goals you need to show up in life to really take charge and be the best self be the best version that you can be for you most importantly but the people around you as well Sleep is important. It's not the only thing that can keep you energized throughout the day. Movement is, eating good, healthy food is, maybe even planning in a nap, a small nap under 20 minutes could help recharge if it's well placed in a day. Boost energy by being physically active and eating well, obviously. Little things make a big difference. Your posture, if you're down this, this is energy draining. If you're sitting up tall and that's energy giving. Breathing in your belly, making sure you get good breath and you're not shallow breathing all day. Being honest with yourself and not focusing on toxic, negative, stressful situations. So I want to thank you. I appreciate your time today, your focus, your energy. would love to have any questions that you have for me. You can put it in the chat box or the Q&A. What is some of the most energy giving exercises that you do or activities that you do in your day? Appreciate that. I'm very glad this is useful advice. I tried to dive deep. Uh, the, the main couple things that I see the most important, there's got to be movement in a day. From talking to, I've had probably 50 phone, uh, yeah, phone calls this week, even. Movement, you have to move, you have to manage your nutrition, eating healthy, balanced meals, frequent enough throughout the day, practicing good portions, so you have balanced meals. You need to get adequate amounts of sleep, you need to drink adequate amounts of water. If you focus on those five pieces, you're going to be better than most in terms of doing well, taking care of yourself, but even more importantly, focusing on yourself and your own self-care. That's tremendously important as well. So I want to thank you all. 
So I find working remotely challenging, challenges the task of keeping moving. I totally would agree with you. I work with a lot of people in a remote situation. You literally have to plan breaks in your day. You literally have, even you could do this with one of your coworkers at 2 p.m., say say three o'clock, you get the energy slump. Hey, coworker, at 2 p.m., let's go on a walk. We can talk on the phone about some of the situations we're doing rather than doing a Zoom thing or something. Walk and talk meetings could be really productive. But if you you plan a walk break around 2-ish or 1.30, that's going to give you more energy going into that 3 o'clock. And that's important. Exactly. You must be disciplined and take a break. I find that I don't do this enough. Literally ask yourself, if you... If you took, if, if you work for eight hours a day straight through, how productive are you going to be? You humans, you're literally not going to be productive by definition of what we are as creatures. You can't just produce and produce and produce. You actually have to have work activity and rest activities planned in your day. Even using a timer could really help with that. Or again, prioritizing work breaks to or walking breaks to clear your mind or shift between tasks. Okay, I have this meeting or this meeting, this meeting. I have to take a 15-minute break to go walk and move my body to then show up to the next thing I have to do. Taking breaks and being disciplined is critically important for you to have success. So, that wellness underscore services at wellable.com.